WI. This meeting is being recorded. And as they just said, this meeting is being recorded and all of the Treasure Valley meetings are then can be accessed through Treasure Valley uh, to Treasure Valley uh, NKA on YouTube so that our classes do go up on YouTube so that you can uh, do them. Um, one of the things that is important to note is that you can still register for upcoming classes. But I'm just going to tell you about the classes occurring within a week. There is a scenic wildlife uh, photography class. Tomorrow is the Idaho Mercy Train boxcar, and that's at the old uh, penitentiary. It should be very interesting. Tai Chi breathing and stretching will start on the uh, 26th, which is a Monday, and then it goes on for uh, four Mondays. And the music circle and connections, as people who have musical abilities and musical instruments get together and play music. So all of these, you can still uh, sign up for these classes. Um, now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let Dr. Uh, Makings introduce himself because uh, he's very good at introducing himself. I'll have to you, doctor. Okay, I guess I'm, you can hear me? I'm, I'm not muted? No, you're not muted. Okay, good. Uh, as, just a couple of quick changes there, Debbie. Uh, I, uh, I taught at uh, College of Southern Idaho. I am in oh, Kimberly sorry. right now. Uh, I taught at, uh, at CSI here in Twin Falls for a good number of years. I am currently uh, uh, Professor Emeritus there. I've uh, done a couple of additional little community ed classes through them, et cetera. So um, anyway, a couple of things I wanted to say just sort of in, in, in by way of, of introduction. Uh, the first thing is that <clears throat> I spent about 40 years teaching uh, college university level classes and we had uh, you know, we had 18 weeks, an hour and a half, or uh, so, uh, three days a week. So, <laughs> trying to cram all of this stuff into it, condense all of this stuff into 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 three class sessions uh, was had just been driving me nuts here the last uh, week or so. But uh, what I'd like to do is just you know present some information uh, about a whole bunch of things that are all kind of coming together at, at one time here, and then uh, you know, as as we said, we can have some just a discussion or whatever kind of at the uh, uh, at the end of each class period. So let me just uh, a little bit more of an introduction about me. Oops here. Uh, you can probably you can probably see I'm uh, I was born in 1948. So uh, that means uh, you know I'm 74, 75 years old. Uh, and and I'm, I'm doing this just to give you a little bit of background of kind of where am I, you know, I'm, where I'm kind of coming from. Um, my dad was a World War II vet, um, you know, came in a small town in uh, western Kansas, a little tiny town of Atwood, uh, just to give you, you know, kind of a, a feel for what a lot of those people were going through. Um, dad graduated from high school. At that time, I think he said he'd probably never been more than 50 or 60 miles away from Atwood, Kansas, uh, which was very typical of a lot of things. Um, I graduated, uh, got on a train, headed off to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through uh, uh, some training there, shipped him off to uh, uh, England, and uh, he spent his 18th Christmas in the Arden Forest with General George Patton trying to uh, get to Bastogne to relieve the 101st and 82nd Airborne guys who were there. Uh, so that's, um, you know, those, those people have, they've been through some tough times. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you know, he, he came back, we uh, had a small farm there in Atwood. I moved, we moved to uh, Colorado when I was fairly young, but I spent uh, summers and, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas vacations back on the farm, helping my grandparents and great aunts and uncles and so forth. Um, and I, I heard a lot of, you know, a lot of the discussion of the depression uh, of the Dust Bowl, of course, Western Kansas is right in the middle of the Dust Bowl, uh, you know, the uh, Spanish flu, 18, 18, 18, 18, 19, or 1920, um, World War One, World War Two, all of those kinds of things. And, um, you know, those, those people, those people have been through some tough times. So that's, that's kind of, that's kind of my perspective of, you know, 
of the world. And uh, just to compare that with um, kind of what we think of as tough times today. So anyway, uh, I did get my, my BS and my MS in, at Colorado. And then we, um, we moved out here and I uh, finished up my doctorate up at, uh, up at U of I. So uh, if we have any other, uh, yeah, if we have any other folks here, why welcome. And like I said, I taught at CSI for 38 years. Some stuff I was going to do, and, and I was going to uh, kind of break this up into some discussions today, starting off with um, climate change and carbon dioxide and that kind of stuff, some discussion there. And then uh, next Wednesday, bring in some of the other kinds of things that are going on. And then uh, the, the Wednesday after that, talk about some kind of solutions, just some, some kind of stuff we might do. I wanted to bring this in tonight, though, because it's a little bit time sensitive, and I don't know where uh, you, you all are located. But um, uh, I am a member of this uh, group, and it's just recently kind of getting started, the uh, Idaho uh, Solar Owners Network. And if any of you are interested in joining that group, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, another one is the Magic Valley Energy. Uh, some of you may, again, if you're close to this area, you may be aware that uh, they are, uh, have proposed a large scale uh, wind uh, energy project um, out called the Lava Ridge out here uh, in part of, partly in Twin Falls County. So uh, you might want to uh, just, just check into that to, uh, and just kind of get some information about them. But and again, I just brought that up right now. We'll talk more about it when we, when we get into the kind of the solutions part. But uh, uh, some of this stuff is, uh, is kind of time sensitive. So if you wanted to, if you were interested in why, maybe jump right out there and do that. Okay. Um, I am been accused sometimes of being out to save the planet. And just to clarify a couple of things, um, you know, I'm really not too concerned about the planet. The planet was just fine for billions of years before we showed up. Uh, if we all work together and make some major changes, or if we go through, as you, as you can see, some of the possible scenarios here, we are, uh, we, we, the human population, reduce ourselves to a few nomadic tribes uh, or eliminate ourselves completely, the planet will be just fine in a couple of hundred years after that. So uh, we're, we're not trying to save the planet. I'm just trying to make it as, as much of a livable uh, place as I can. And again, as I've said lots of times, not only for me, I'm not going to be around here too much longer. All of the things that I do, I'm doing for my children, who are now grown, of course, and have kids. So I'm basically doing all of this stuff for my kids and grandkids. So um, that's, oops, here. Okay. So as I, as I mentioned before, today we want to talk about the problems. And then Wednesday, some of the other kinds of things that are, that are getting involved here, and then the solutions. Um, one of the things that I have taught most of my life, well, I did a lot of, uh, taught a lot of stuff about uh, emerging technology. I taught some computer applications classes back when we had Apple IIe computers and uh, Radio Shack and some of those kinds of things back with uh, uh, when we thought we were top of the line, when we had uh, two uh, five and a quarter floppy disk drives on our Apple computers. And uh, I, the first computer that I bought I was talking to uh, the sales people and they said, well, yeah, this is, this is gigantic. It has, uh, it has eight megabytes of storage and ah, you'd never need any more than that. So, <laughs> and now, you know, I don't know, we, we, we're measuring our storage capacity in, in uh, kilobytes now. So, I mean, and, and megabytes and all kinds of stuff. So, um, so I've always been doing that kind of thing and, and, um, a lot of environmental approach rather than, you know, anatomy and physiology is pretty straightforward. You talk about this, this, uh, you know, this body system, this body system, this body system. The kinds of stuff that we're talking about now is like a bowl, a ball of yarn, all kinds of things. In, in, anytime we start down one path, there's always two or three things, other things that, that uh, impact it. Uh, so you could, you could you know, kind of refer to that as a ball of yarn or, a nest of rattlesnakes or some giant squid. You know, you think you have a good handle on one thing, and here comes another arm out there. So, um, 
of a discussion is not going to be real linear and we will be moving back and forth and that's why I would like to always leave some time at the end of each little session for any discussions or uh, you know some uh, clarification etc one last little thing before we kind of get into it here I recently heard a uh, short presentation uh, by former President Barack Obama and uh, he was talking about basically this kind of stuff the difference between optimism and hope and and right now as as uh, President Obama said we may have very little optimism, but we always have hope. and right now I'm looking at this situation and I have very little optimism but there is always hope so I guess that's that's kind of where I am as we proceed forward Okay, so what we want to and what we'll start talking about tonight, uh, basically the climate change, carbon dioxide, methane, and et cetera. Okay. And that's that's kind of the gonna be the kind of the core emphasis, and then some of these other factors uh, that are uh, impacting it or making it worse or whatever. Carbon dioxide and methane, and some of this may be, you know, old news to you guys. Some of it may be fairly new. I'm just trying to kind of hit down the middle of the road. Carbon dioxide and methane, there are other gases that are that, that do the same thing, but they are they're called greenhouse gases. Greenhouse because of the they function the same way as the greenhouse. The shorter wave rays from the sunlight coming in, shorter wavelength here, 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 come in and they will, and as they pass through this, they pass through this layer of carbon dioxide, methane, and et cetera, up here in the atmosphere. Um, and as they, do, as they do, as they progress down through here, the, the wavelengths get longer and longer. And then if they bounce off of something as heat, then those wavelengths are much longer and these molecules of carbon dioxide and methane and a few other things actually trap that heat or absorb that heat. And a lot of it is reflected back down onto the earth then. So they're actually trapping heat, much like if you sit in a, if you're sitting in your car, uh, you know, in the, even in the middle of winter with your windshield facing the sun, uh, you can, the, the interior of your car will get pretty darn warm even in the winter time because that sunshine the light passes through the glass, but when it hits anything on the interior of the car, the light does, it's, uh, it's absorbed and then re-radiated re, re as heat, and the glass reflects that heat back into the car. It up. Um, main aspect here is um, the, the carbon the carbon cycle and I wanted to spend just a, a little bit of time with this tonight and then we'll be we'll be coming back to this as we uh, as we go along so uh, carbon carbon is in the carbon dioxide is in the is in the atmosphere but we've had carbon dioxide in the atmosphere all the time uh, or at least you know, certainly within the last several billion years. So um, carbon dioxide is absorbed by plants, a process called photosynthesis. They, the plants take carbon dioxide and water and they split the water molecule, which is kind of an amazing process of and by itself. Uh, they split the, uh, the um, yeah, the water molecule and, and combine then or they pull out some of the carbon and it combines with that um, with the water with the elements of the water molecule and make um, uh, carbonates okay uh, hydrocarbons hydrocarbons sugar you know all of it that's basically the hydrocarbon is a generic name for those kinds of molecules and in, and and it, actually it's, it's very makes a lot of sense uh, you think of hydrocarbons as wet carbon dioxide, wet carbon, okay? So they combine, they, oops here, photosynthesis, okay? And then uh, that, those, those you know, uh, animals eat that stuff, uh, 
the plants millions of years ago, huge number of plants absorbed some of that carbon that created those hydrocarbons, they died and then were covered up by, you know, in the swamps, they were covered up and I'm greatly simplifying this, but covered up with mud and silt and debris and so forth, and then compressed for millions of years. And that's when we get coal and crude oil and natural gas. Okay? And those, those, the reason those things are called fossil fuels is that because they come from, I mean, they've been underground for a long period of time, like, like other fossils. Okay? So it's, that's, the origin of, that's the origin of fossil fuels. All of that stuff at one time was, I mean, came from carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere, uh, from plants, uh, uh, algae, uh, moss, et cetera. A lot of times, you know, growing in the swamps and those kinds of places. So they, that, that um, then when those plants died, a lot of times in the in swamps or in the ocean, then they settled to the bottom, they were covered up with silt and mud and so forth, uh, sealed off from uh, any um, any 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 further oxygen, so there was no uh, there was no uh, decomposition of them, and uh, you know the bacteria didn't didn't uh, decompose them. So they uh, and then under a lot of pressure, formed carbon dioxide, uh, formed I'm sorry, coal, oil, natural gas, etc. All right. So now then, when we when we burn those fossil fuels, then we take that carbon that has been removed from the atmosphere for millions, millions of years, and we put that back up into the atmosphere. So we are adding additional carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. It was there at one time, but now it has not been for a lot of years, and now we're adding it back into, back up into the atmosphere. Okay. Now, in addition to that then, um, What's happening also today is that, of course, you know, animals are eating these plants, and they are giving off carbon dioxide. Their, you know, their respiration there, and even the, you know, if the plants die and uh, decompose on the surface here, then that also gives off carbon dioxide. And that's kind of a, that's a, kind of an, an important point that I want you to, to hang on to. As we get into talking about some of the solutions and just a real quick thing here, a lot of people, I mean, not a, a lot of people that talk about, oh yeah, you know, and hear a lot of talk about planting trees as the solution to all of this stuff. And yes, trees are great and wonderful critters. They're, I think they're one of the neatest things and one of the neatest things around. I really like trees. But when we get right down to the nitty gritty, remember that this tree has been growing here. Maybe a tree has been growing here for 15, 20, maybe for a hundred years, but eventually, that tree is going to die. And you know, if we don't do anything else about it, it's gonna die, it's gonna to fall to the earth, uh, it's going to be decomposed, or it's gonna be caught up in some wildfire and burned and produce, release all of that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So <clears throat> yes, planting trees is a good thing to do and they are nice to look at and they do provide shade mm -hmm. and they do provide all those kinds of things, but it is not a, in and of itself, they're not a long-term solution to this because, <coughs> excuse me, what they've really done is just store some of this carbon dioxide in here for a short period of time. And then again, whether they die or burn or whatever happens to them, they are released back into the, that CO2 is released back into the atmosphere. So um, yeah, so planting trees is a, good thing to do, but, and here's the, the, the kicker that a lot of people don't, and I, and I like to push this, one of the greatest things, of advantages, one of the greatest things you can do is go out and plant some trees or to go out and, and you know, find some trees that are <coughs> decayed or damaging, damaged or whatever, and cut those trees down and then use those trees as a fuel source to reduce, to eliminate and reduce the use of fossil fuels. Uh, I know we hear people talk about, well, you know, uh, so you have a wood burning stove at home. Well, you know, you're just putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and da da da. Well, that's true, you are. But if you use that wood burning stove to heat your house and you're not using coal, oil, or natural gas, then you are you are basically 
putting CO2 back into the atmosphere, but it's CO2 that was in the atmosphere not too long ago anyway. So you're really not increasing the, the amount. Uh, you're just you know, creating a little short cycle right in through here, right? as opposed to, again, allowing that tree to die. And then that CO2 is, is composed up in here. And in the meantime, you're going out and uh, using natural gas uh, to heat your house. Okay? So again, uh, this, is, this is not going to be you know, the solution. And that's one of the things we will talk about often as we go along through here. There are no simple solutions. There are no silver bullets to this problem. Every possible solution has some drawbacks or some shortcomings or some negative aspects to it. Every one of them does. Everyone but, but one I can think of. Um, and so what we need to do is to be able to look at what are the overall larger impacts of this whole, of everything we're doing. And, um, you know, yes, indeed. Uh, if, uh, well, uh, for example, uh, ethanol uh, made out of grain, uh, you know, corn, milo, et cetera. So we take that and then we, uh, <clears throat> you know, make, make basically make beer out of it and then distill the alcohol off and use it for, uh, to, you know, supplement our uh, liquid fuel for our cars. Okay, so yes, we are taking that grain and putting that carbon dioxide right back into the atmosphere. But again, that is carbon dioxide that was already in the atmosphere as opposed to using crude oil and refining it and making gasoline and taking carbon dioxide that has been removed from the atmosphere for millions, billions of years and dumping it up and dumping it into the atmosphere. So that's, that's the problem. It's not that we are you know, not putting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is when we take uh, carbon and carbohydrates that have been removed from the atmosphere for millions of years. The whole planet has adjusted to that level of carbon dioxide, but now we are adding more to it, adding additional carbon dioxide to that, to that layer. And that just increases then, uh, if we go back to here, the more carbon dioxide we have in here, the greater this, this impact is, the greater the amount of this, uh, heat that's re-radiated back out is going to be trapped and, and held uh, long in the you know in that in that upper atmosphere. Okay, so once released from from fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for about uh, three hundred to maybe a thousand years. Now, some of it does, in, you know, as with anything in the atmosphere, we are losing bits and pieces, molecules of the atmosphere escape from the Earth's planetary attraction, and we are constantly losing gases out into the, out into space, okay? All kinds of things, and then, I don't know, you know they're replaced by, by others, and, and that's just kind of a big cycle. But the, the CO2 that we've released today, if we do nothing about it, most of it's just going to stay in the atmosphere for, you know, 300, maybe a couple thousand years, okay? Um, <clears throat> So now that we're kind of moving on to the to another point here, uh, so that's going to stay in the atmosphere for a long time. Now, as we mentioned before, several of these sub cycles can occur, uh, can be absorbed by plants, and it stays. You know, some of the trees, some of the uh, some of the giant sequoia that were threatened by some for, by some fires earlier this uh, this summer there in California, some of those trees are a thousand years old. So some of the Carbohydrates, some of the carbon, carbo, carbon dioxide that those trees absorb uh, has been out of the atmosphere for a thousand years. But you know, uh, so now we now that if they if they burn up in a forest fire, then they're just re releasing that that um, CO two back into the air. Okay, uh, it can also be absorbed into the oceans. Uh, one of the things that happens when 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 the and the oceans do absorb uh, carbon dioxide. They become um, slightly more acidic, and that's that's some fairly sophisticated uh, chemistry that's going on there. And um, I'm not sure that I, you know, I'm a pretty good science background, but to be able to explain exactly what's happening there, uh, I I'd have to go back and, and and review and review a little bit on that. But basically, what happens is the, the oceans are becoming more acidic, changing the pH. 
Now, if so you say, well, hmm, well, again, because the plants and animals living in the ocean have evolved and adjusted to the pH that we've had for the last several thousand years. And now if we begin to go back and change that, then a lot of those, a lot of those organisms are going to be unable to tolerate that. And, um, you know, and then uh, coral reefs is a, is a good example. And the, uh, uh, the Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Australia that's been studied extensively. Uh, documented the amount of, of uh, death among the, the actual coral uh, the organisms that have you know, secrete the, the uh, calcium around there and uh, form the reef. So uh, a lot of that is, is we are being able to document that already. So. Now, <clears throat> and here's another thing that we, that we don't, I think we, a lot of people are not cognizant of this. We, we hear a lot of talk about if we can, uh, if we can reduce our carbon emissions by, you know, the year 2030 or the 2015 or whatever, whatever it might be, yes, that's going to help. But remember that whatever level of carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere right now, even if we stopped in putting any more in there, that level is going to be there. That amount of carbon dioxide is going to be there for a long time. So it's still going to continue to trap. Uh, more heat than the earth did 200 years ago when there was not that much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So even if we, even if we stop adding more carbon dioxide, which is going to be one terrifically horrendous task, and, and we'll bring in some of those factors there a bit later on, but that's going to be a horrendous task to do that. And even if we even if we do so, the Earth still has that certain that greater level of con greater concentration of carbon dioxide in the upper atmosphere, so it's going to continue to warm for uh, a while beyond that. Now, what they're saying is, if we can reduce our carbon dioxide, um, you know, by 2030, then and you always have to read the rest of the sentence we may be able to avoid some of the greatest catastrophes that are projected and predicted by all of the computer models and all of that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> again, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not a real happy outlook, even if we manage to eliminate any additional CO2 going into the atmosphere in the next 15 or 20 years, it's still, it's still gonna be pretty tough out there for quite a while. That's, I mean, again, that's just something that we need to, that we need to keep in mind. Oops here. Okay. Um, some impacts here of, and again, we're right now, we're just talking about, uh, we're talking about global warming, climate change, whatever. <clears throat> One of the things that has me less optimistic <laughs> still have hope, but less optimistic, is that it's not just that, but it is all of the other impacts, all of the other things that are happening, not only weather-wise, but a lot of other things that are, that are going to be happening too. Okay, one of the first things, I don't know what that was. <laughs> one, of the, one of the first things is that the atmosphere is more volatile. Um, now we hear say people, this is the biggest uh, rain downpour and the biggest flooding that we've had for uh, in maybe in history or for hundreds of years. And we have the biggest droughts that we have going on over here. And then we have floods going on you know, over here. Well, that's again, that is, well, first of all, that's the kind of things that are being predicted, not, not forecast, we can't say exactly when, but that are being predicted by all of the models is that as the atmosphere gets more volatile, then, then the changes are more drastic um, and, and more rapid and um, the types of you know, storms and that kind of stuff. So yes, it's very, you know, we, we may very well see continued drought in 
<clears throat> very a great deal of the Western United States and, and other, you know, other countries, other parts of the world too. And at the same time, some of the worst floods that we've ever seen in history. Uh, again, just because the, the atmosphere is so volatile, there's so much energy in it and that any of the storms are getting worse, the droughts are getting worse, that all those kinds of things just because of the, of the volatility of the, of the atmosphere. And that's, sometimes that's kind of hard to predict too. People talk about, people used to say, oh, global warming. Oh yeah, well, so it'd be kind of like, uh, oh, you know, kind of like maybe uh, everybody on the planet gets to live in, oh, kind of like, you know, Hawaii, <laughs> or, you know, we can run around in shorts and t-shirts all year and, and oh, it never gets really cold, all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, that's, that's not what global warming, I mean, it's going to be warmer, but it's going to also be a whole lot of these very violent, um, very extreme storms all over the place, right? The melting ice is a problem, uh, and that's been, again, well documented. And so we talk about um, sea level rise, and, and, and another one of the problems that we have here, and I keep, you know, that's what I'm saying, is that it's not, it's not one simple thing. It is all a whole bunch of these little uh, cross sections, a whole bunch of those arms from the squid keep coming out every time we think we have a handle on something. Well, here comes another, here comes another arm from that giant squid to grab a hold of us. Not only are we talking about sea level rise, which is very slow and, and very you know, well an inch or so, and, but, but you know that that makes a that's going to make a big impact. But there are a lot of other things that go along with that. One of the things that we are, I think, again, starting to be made a little bit more aware of is that um, as, the, as we, some of these areas warm, then we are going to see the release of pathogens, virus, and even uh, some bacteria and so forth that have been frozen, stored away in that, in that permafrost, and they remain viable, uh, but they've been stored for maybe thousands of years. Uh, so it's not a brand new virus, but it is one that, that to, we have no immunities to, we have no natural immunities to. So we are going to see more and more of those kinds of pandemic sorts of episodes popping up. Uh, and you know, some of them may be relatively uh, locally controlled or whatever, but, that, but that's, we are going to see more in that kind of stuff. And then the thawing of the permafrost, and it's called permafrost because it's, it's been frozen for a long period of time. Um, several years ago, I had the, um, well, it was an opportunity. It was kind of an interesting experiment or not interesting activity. I spent two weeks in Barrow, Alaska. It was in, I think, about March. And I was up there doing some presentations and actually working with, uh, actually working with what's called the North Slope Borough Education District, which was, I don't know, several hundred miles big up there. Um, and uh, helping them. This was back in the early days when they were doing some uh, 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 video and, and uh, microwave communications. And so kind of helping them get set up with that kind of stuff. And, that, and at the same time, actually uh, interviewed for a job up there, uh, working with the that North Slope Education District, uh, teaching some you know, college level uh, classes out. Anyway, it was, it was a couple, just a couple of interesting things. Um, into March, and uh, uh, now moving from one building to another, glanced over, and the uh, all the high school, a bunch of high school students, boys and boys and girls out there, and one of the very few uh, paved areas that they have. In fact, that's maybe that was the only one um, there for a basketball court. And these guys are out there. Uh, you know, it, it got to be, I think, fifteen, almost twenty degrees above. 20 degrees Fahrenheit above zero, and everybody's out there in their uh, in their shorts and their t-shirts playing basketball. You know, <laughs> it just kind of depends on what you get used to. But actually, it was it actually was pretty nice up there with the, all that snow around. The sun was reflecting off the off the sun and off the snow, and it actually felt pretty good. But all of that infrastructure that's up there, oil pipelines, buildings, and all that kind of stuff, is the, the substructure, the, the, the actual components of building components, the foundations and so forth are dependent upon that permafrost. So as that starts to melt, thaw and melt on a, on a large scale, 
then we are going to have all sorts of problems there with you know, uh, gas and oil pipelines as well as you know roads and, and that kind of stuff. So you know with all of those, a lot of those other you know, little kinds of things that are that that are and will be popping up as we go along. Now, I also wanted to include in this a little bit here some discussion of that kind of ties in here also. Uh, see how we're doing time here. Uh, plastics. The amount of plastic that is out there, in fact, uh, right here. Recent study found that people eat five grams of micro or nano plastic, nano mic, mic, microscopic or nano, very, very small uh, plastic fibers every week. This is approximately the mass of a credit card. So uh, every week you are in the drinking water, uh, frequently in the air you breathe, uh, the food that you eat, whether it be hamburger, carrots, potato chips. There are microfibers and nanofibers of plastic in just about everywhere. Um, and that's approximately how you eat uh, every week. It's, it's about like eating a credit card. We do not know all of the possible impacts of that long-term impacts of that. Um, some early studies have shown some, recent, have shown some uh, indica indicated some harm to uh, fetuses, uh, you know, unborn babies. Uh, and so, you know, if, as that's, that's something to be concerned about. And the amount of plastics that we go through, uh, it just, it's just unbelievable. And I've done, a, get, for this class, I, I've done a little bit more research into that. And now it, it really uh, has been brought home. I have, um, I have, a two, I have several grandchildren around. Some of them are in South Dakota. A couple of them are in Tampa with my daughter and her husband. And the number of disposable diapers that those people go through, uh, it's just unbelievable. And then you multiply that by, I know, how many thousands of parents are out there with kids with their disposable diapers. And again, being as old as I am, I remember the day when we had, you know, cloth diapers and uh, you checked every so often. And if the diaper was wet or dirty, why well, you took it off and rinsed it out and uh, threw it in the washing machine and, and you washed them and then uh, hung them out on the clothesline. That's where we had, well, some people had dryers, but that's what we did with them. And, uh, you know, yes, it was some work, but uh, you know, that was, that's just one of the differences between then and now. We weren't throwing all of that plastic out there. Uh, plastic water bottles, plastic this, plastic that. Uh, that's just everywhere. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time with this, and I'm not going to get into a lot of the science of, of the plastics, but... Uh, I put this in here just as kind of a, a point to make of this is not just a simple discussion of well you know if we you know if we all kind of cut back on our on our whatever and release less carbon dioxide there are a whole bundle of these things that are coming together at about the same time um, and that's and that's that to me is that to me is very simple. I mean, it's hard enough to it's hard enough to focus the public attention and to get some action on any any one of these things, but to try to convince people that we need to be working on all of these at the same time um, is pretty tough. Another factor that has come in and you know, not necessarily caused by um, climate change, although that has been a trigger and a sort of a, yeah, I guess a trigger mechanism uh, for a lot of this social unrest 
that we have going on today. There was an interesting uh, interview on 60 Minutes, by the way. I was sitting there watching 60 Minutes the other day, thinking back to my early days shortly after I graduated, shortly after I got my master's degree, I was teaching high school biology in Oakley, Kansas. And um, Kathy, my wife, was working at the hospital there. She was a nurse's aide. Uh, she was working at the hospital. She frequently had the night shift. So <clears throat> I would be home with the, with the kids in the evening till she got home at 11 o'clock. Anyway, I, I can remember a lot of times sitting there with our TV and um, we had three channels. And by the way, you had to get up and actually, you know, manually turn the little knob there. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if any of you even remember those days. And if you wanted to turn the volume up, you had to reach over, you walk over there and turn the volume up. And then sometimes you had to go in and actually adjust the, I don't know if you guys remember the rabbit ears, you had to kind of change them around a little bit so that the, so you get a little bit better reception. Anyway, we had three channels. Um, and of course the big thing in the fall was that there was uh, football games, NFL football games on Sunday. We didn't have Thursday night, we didn't have Monday night, we didn't have all of those kinds of things. We had a few football games on Sunday. Well, I can remember watching the end of the football game, the kids would be, we had two little kids at that time, and they'd be around there taking care of them. And then uh, uh, 60 Minutes would come on. And so I, you know, that was kind of a routine of ours. We would kind of get together, kids and I on the couch, and then we kind of watch 60 Minutes. I mean, they didn't know what was going on, but it was, it was just kind of a calm down time. When 60 Minutes was over, then we'd get in the, they'd get in the bathtub and we'd put them in bed. But I, anyway, sitting there watching 60 Minutes the other day just brought back some memories from, and sure enough, <clears throat> they actually mentioned this is their 55th year of 60 Minutes on CBS, I guess it is. Anyway, surely brought back a lot of memories. But the thing that came up that I thought was pretty profound, um, one of the interviews that they were going through, uh, the interviewer said, you know, it seems like politics has changed from a sort of, you know, mild, at least gentlemanly or ladylike uh, somewhat professional discussion of, well, you know, you, the other person, you may have a bad idea, but let's, maybe we can even talk about it or let's kind of, you know, switch around and, 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 you know, and I'm sure that maybe you think I have some bad ideas, et cetera. And now the whole <clears throat> political scheme seems to be not the other person has a bad idea, <clears throat> the other person is a bad person. Whatever you come up with is, I'm not going to agree. I'm not going to agree with it. It's not that I disagree with one little component that you have, anything that you say, I'm automatically opposed to it. And, and that's, um, that's concerning, okay? Uh, and it is, you know, degenerated to uh, threats and harassment of people who have different ideas. Uh, and then this whole concept of entitlement, you know, I'm, I'm entitled to this and I'm entitled to that. Now I know we're moving away from biology and the science and so forth, but I just want to give you some idea of, you know, of the, all of the intricacies involved and some of the difficulties that we are having and will have in solving this biological problem. That kind of stuff right there. Oops here. Another factor, um, that gets very little attention today. And again, I was, uh, well, I graduated from high school in 1967. I was a uh, college student, you know, 68, 69, 70. Um, that was the year of the era of um, Silent Spring, uh, Paul Ehrlich's uh, population bomb, uh, Garrett Hardin's. Um, lifeboat ethics. And by the way, I would encourage you guys to at least get online and look up a little bit of information about the population bomb and about uh, lifeboat ethics. Uh, and, uh, and some of the some of the material that was coming out uh, in those days, uh, you know, some of the, because of some of the environmental problems that we were having. And, um, you know, just, just look back at, at the origins of some of these things. Uh, and I'm always, always reminded of a um, conversation that I had with a good friend of mine who was a geology instructor there. This was like teaching at um, Colby Community College. It's a small, uh, 
small college in, in Colby, Kansas. I know that's the west corner of Kansas is going to be back that way on I-70. Good friend of mine, uh, was a college and this was about the time of the, in, <laughs> I don't know how old some of you guys are out there, but you, you may never even have heard of this, the Arab oil embargo. And uh, uh, the, you know, the Arab, uh, which eventually be, became OPEC, and they were demanding higher prices and for their crude oil and all that sort of stuff. And then uh, <clears throat> price of gasoline was outlandish, totally outlandish. I can remember having and hearing on you know, discussion and uh, people were actually predicting that if the price of a gallon of gasoline got to be 75 cents, that was going to totally disrupt the entire American economy and the whole world was gonna fall apart. If gasoline got to be 75 cents a gallon. And I can tell you, if there's gasoline for 75 cents a gallon today, the whole world might be falling apart because we're all running to that place to get some gasoline. So just, uh, just a matter of perspective. But anyway, um, so this guy was telling me, this good friend of mine, that um, we were talking about running out of crude oil or running out of coal or running out of stuff. And he said, no, don't be worried about that. This was back again in, in, in the uh, mid to late 70s. Don't be worried about running out of stuff. There's a lot of crude oil. There's a lot of coal under the ground. There's a lot of stuff out there. He said, what you need to be concerned about is the fact that we are dumping a lot of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And that was you know, well before we had all of this, you know, all this concerns about it. But you know, as again, as, as a geologist, he, he understood the fact that we are putting into the atmosphere carbon dioxide that has been sequestered, has been moved out of the atmosphere for millions and billions of years. And the entire ecosystem had evolved and adapted to that, not only the weather, but the plants and so forth. The entire ecosystem was built around that level of carbon dioxide that had been there for millions of years. And now we are adding a bunch more to it. And so that's, again, where uh, some of this comes in because the human, human population growth, and that's again, Paul Ehrlich's um, treatise on the population bond. Maybe it's, it was printed a good number of years ago, but it's still very interesting reading. Let me just show you <clears throat> this and this part right here is kind of hard to comprehend, but here is the human population. And of course we didn't, you know, we didn't have the census back then, but we have some good ideas of some, and some scientific ways together about how many people there were around. And look at this low here. And then about right in here, 19, 1804, 19, 1960. So we've gone from, we've gone from what? About a billion people here. 200 years ago to pretty close to 10 billion people now, coming up now pretty soon. And so here we are in 2023, right at about 8 billion people. Now, let's look at this. This is the carbon dioxide readings. And this, some of this stuff has been taken care of, have been ice core, ice core data that. Uh, that means this was that was collected before 1958 and that so and but some of that ice remember has been there for thousands of years um and then after that they started using and i think mauna loa was the some of the uh, trapping and capturing some of the ash studying some of the ash from that volcano so but again the point is look at this carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere 10,000 2000 years ago and then look at the carbon dioxide level from here up to today, how much that has increased. And look at the comparison here, human population, carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, so there's, I mean, you know, to me, there's no way that you can deny that we are, as we, as we are adding more and more people, we are, dumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, so one of the things that we can do is to stabilize and eventually, I'm proposing, uh, 
stabilize or, and reduce eventually uh, the worldwide human population. And that can be done uh, humanely and, and with you know, some, uh, what am I trying to say, you know, logically, reasonably, et cetera. So that is one of the factors that uh, in my view, regardless of what other things we accomplish, if we reduce the per person carbon dioxide uh, by 5%, but the human population increases by 7%, <laughs> we haven't gained anything. It's, we haven't gained anything. We're still losing ground. So at some point, that's going to have to be addressed also. Okay, okay let's see what else we had here. All right, so just wanted to kind of um, tie this up and then uh, maybe we'll just leave us some time for some, just some general kinds of discussion here, okay? So here's, here's what we can do. And again, I want to do little bits of it here, little bits of it uh, next Wednesday, and then, and then the Wednesday after that, maybe kind of try to tie some of this kind of stuff together and, and, and look at some, some longer range kinds of things. But um, the, some of the main points that I wanted to get across is some of the things we can do, first of all, to, to reduce the human population. And I guess showing a little bit of my pessimism now over this deal, um, I am, I'm fairly certain that the human population is going to be less in 30, 40 years than it is now, one way or the other. Okay. Uh, we're, we're looking at some major, major problems. Okay. Another thing we can do is to view our actions, the things that we do now, and the decisions that we make, not in terms of payoff time or return on investment. Um, I was going to show you guys, a, you take my computer out there and show you guys a picture of the solar panels on my, on this building that I'm in here. And that's, this is kind of a long story. I won't get into that one tonight, but uh, Put up solar panels a couple of, well, several months ago. I'm in the process of buying a electric vehicle. <laughs> I'm in the process of getting on the lift for being able to order an electric vehicle. Which <laughs> last time, last time I checked, the guy was telling me he said something about uh, I was thinking about this pickup, the electric pickup. Oh, he said, yeah, you know, we're talking about a wait year, maybe you know, 18 months, two years. And I said, oh. He said, no, that's, that's when you can put your name on the list to get one <laughs> two years after that. So I'm, I'm not sure how, how bad that's going to be. But anyway, um, I am in the process of buying an electric vehicle. And then I hear people say, well, you know, I do that too. But, you know, look at the payback. How long is it going to take you to pay that back? And then my response immediately is, guys, I'm, I'm not doing this to make money. I'm not doing this because I'm concerned about getting some money back in my lifetime. I'm doing this because I want to make life a little bit better for my kids and your kids. And that's where that's one of the things that we need to be looking at. Um, yes, indeed. It does. If you just look at the amount of money that you save because you installed some solar panels and, you know, so, so you're going to save $100 a month on your electric bill. How many months is that going to take you to pay off those solar panels? Well, it's going to take you a while. That's that's true. Uh, not your entire lifetime, but it's going to take a long time. <clears throat> and when you look at that as um, this is not an investment that I can that I'm looking at putting my money back and then making much money afterwards. I'm making an investment for my kids and for my grandkids. Oops, here. Another thing we need to remember as we're going along, and we can have a little bit of discussion about this. Uh, here this evening even, is that no one solution is perfect. No one solution, and that's, that's a problem that we have, again, with a lot of people that are looking for, well, tell me the, what's the magic bullet? You know, what's the silver bullet? What's the thing that we can do that will cure everything? Well, there isn't. There isn't one thing that will cure everything. Everything you come up with has some drawbacks and disadvantages, et cetera. Yes, so I put these solar panels up here. Well, the guy said, well, <laughs> so then what? 25 or 30 years are going to have to recycle that stuff. And then what's going to happen? Well, yeah, they are. And in 25 or 30 years, you know, uh, I'm hoping, well, the, the aluminum in the framework, we can, we can use that, the, the uh, silicon fight, and, da, 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 da. Um, and yes, we can. 
but I can also, there, there will be some, you know, there may be some waste, there may be some stuff there, but I can also tell you that that's going to be better than having, uh, you know, produced all of that electricity uh, using fossil fuels over the next few years. Okay. And again, and then, the, then the last one here is develop a better understanding of how the, how, you know, how the carbon cycle actually works. And that's some stuff that I alluded to earlier uh, is, you know, this understanding, well, yes, it's, it's great to plant trees uh, and, oh, and uh, we're now, because certainly here in Southern Idaho and I, uh, uh, I still have relatives, still have family in, in, uh, in Colorado and in Western Kansas, and the droughts back there, are, that's, that's a major drought area too. And we're, so one of the things they're talking about is um, eliminating uh, all of these lawns and lawns around the walkways and that kind of stuff. And somebody said, well, no, you can't you, you <clears throat> tear that up. Remember that grass is absorbing all that carbon dioxide. Yes, it does. But then, you know, if you go out there and mow your grass every week, so you're taking all of that carbon dioxide that the grass absorbed and either just leaving it there so it decomposes or releases the carbon dioxide, or you collect it, put it in your dumpster, they haul it off to the landfill and they bury it under there so that uh, then it decomposes anaerobically and reduces methane. So yeah. <clears throat> we need to have an understanding of, of, you know, of looking at the longer term picture. Yes, indeed, grass does absorb carbon dioxide. And you know, a lot of times it's a month later, the grass that you cut has been, de has been decomposing and is releasing that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me, <clears throat> so there are really no simple solutions. There are no you know, cut and dried solutions. There's no magic bullet. There's no whatever. It's the bottom line. It's going to take a whole lot of stuff a whole lot of people all working together, okay? And again, this is some of the things that we will talk about, I think, in more detail uh, as we, and especially uh, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that, okay? So I just put these up here, things like some simple things, you know, so some, well, not simple, some of these are larger scale. Decentralize things like the food production and, and, and distribution system. My brother-in-law, um, again, long story, he's, he's living here in Kimberly, um, long haul truck driver. And, <laughs> and he, tells, he tells stories of things um, he spent, he's doing a different kind right now. He has more of, a, more of a set route. But when he first got started, he was, well, they call it gypsy trucking. He was just out there. He'd be out for 30, maybe, you know, three weeks, four weeks, something like that. Just you know, wherever, load, wherever load he could get. He said, he was telling me about, uh, this was several years ago. <clears throat> he picked up a load of apples in Yakima, Washington and hauled them to someplace in New England and drove 25, 30 miles down the road, uh, picked up a load of apples and hauled them to Oregon. So, I mean, back and forth across the, across the United States. He said, he said, it was unbelievable. I did that for four trips, pick up a load there, haul them back, pick up a load of apples there and haul them out here. And he said, now, because of this, I don't know, you know, just the whole, as opposed to the kind of system that I grew up with and the kind of system that my, that, that I, that my grandparents talked to me about. Um, yeah, I mean, so little, some little farmer off over here had uh, four or five apple trees and well, you go out and or you had your own apple trees or whatever. So it's going to take some of those kinds of things, uh, small scale solar panels and wind systems reducing and eliminate plastic. This is the one that, this is the one that uh, to me makes, is just, it's just absolutely common sense, but very few people seem to acknowledge that. Uh, you know, whether you're tired of spending so much money for gas or whatever, uh, drive less, drive slower. Uh, study after study after study has indicated that anything above about 60, 65 miles an hour, regardless of what vehicle you have, anything above that, you are drastically cutting into your fuel efficiency, into your fuel economy. So somebody going down the road at 80 miles an hour uh, may get someplace a little faster than I am, but they are going to spend more money on their gasoline than I did driving at 65. 
um, sitting in line, waiting with your car idling. <clears throat> um, that's, you're just burning up gasoline. And of course, what you could really do is drive electric if you wanted to wait for three years, <laughs> you know, if, if, wait for two years to get on the list and then who knows how long after that's gonna be. So I don't know, I, I'm kind of laughing at it because it's, it's really not funny, but I, I get kind of a kick out of, out of uh, thinking about kind of that, that long-term deal. So anyway, I think at this point, uh, what I would, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, um, <clears throat> Kathy or Debbie, uh, we wanted to uh, open this up to, to any uh, questions or comments or just some general discussion sort of thing. I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to do that for a while. Um, I think what I'd like to do is unmute everyone so that if they have a question, they can ask it. If, would you prefer to hear yeah. their questions from the chat box? Okay. So yeah, that's no, what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I think it's probably, I don't know how many people we have involved here, but, but uh, yeah, I think that would be, to me, that's, you know, a little one-on-one -on -one conversation. If you would, please, whoever's, whoever's uh, you know, asking the question, um, I can name would be fine, but uh, where are you from? I, I have, I'm interested in, in where people are, where people are sitting right now, if you would do that. Okay, I would, uh... Tell me, Kathy, how do I unmute everyone at the same time? You know, Debbie, if you could ask them to raise their hand in the reactions section, then we okay. can then I can unmute them. Okay. Or they can unmute themselves. I see two people. Are can they quite... unmute themselves? Okay. Mm -hmm. If you have a question or a comment, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it. Or people can ask it in chat as well. Yeah. Dave, Dave I have a question, uh, comment. This is Trent Stevens, I'm in Pocatello. Uh -huh. I'm a developmental biologist, a teratologist. Um, I understand the dangers of uh, microfilaments from plastic, but uh, your comment that it causes damage to the fetus, I think is a little bit uh, drastic. What kind of a fetus are you talking about? Well, uh, the, the, the little study that I you know, read, and again, they just said that it indicated there was, again, that's, and you, you're a scientist, you can understand, um, you know, we, we put this little bits of information out. And so we have a little bit of an inkling that, that here's some stuff happening, not that we, you know, want to scare everybody and et cetera, but you know, a lot of times that's, so, so we have a little bit of information here and maybe this might be happening what that's really intended to do, of course, as you know, is to get other people involved. And so let's let's follow up on this and and uh, and see what you know, see what what what's actually going on. Get a lot more research going. Uh, the the information that I gleaned from the from the article um, was primary or primarily oriented around uh, humans. But one would imagine that um, you know, if 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 we are um, probably probably everybody else. I mean, all of the other fetuses are, are susceptible too. So again, that's one of those things that- uh, So, so you, you, are, you are reading a study about the teratogenic effects of um, microfibers on human fetuses? Um, it, was a, it was a very general study about, um, about micro and you know, nanofibers in the atmosphere and just, just very quick look at, you know, what some of the data out there on short studies indicated. So that's at that point, that's that's yeah, all it was. That's a that's a bit some problematic. Indicators. Yeah, that's a lot problematic to me because, as a professional in this field, my 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 uh, professional level is looking at birth defects, uh, and anybody making a comment like that about a human fetus. Uh, is a little bit problematic when you don't have, a, you're not gonna have any data, I can guarantee you on that. I'd, I'd love to see the study. I'd love to see the paper that you're referring to. Yeah, okay, I, and, I, and I, I, um, I guess in a sense, apologize. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying that there's, <laughs> there are some situations out there that I think we need to look further into, so. so. Yeah, I, let me, uh, 
let me go back and you know and, and read through and see if I can come up with um, um, see if I can come up with where I found that little article. I you know I, I read a lot of stuff, and so I will do that. All right. Thank you. Um, JS in Pocatello uh, made a, a comment in the chat where he, uh, JS, would you like to, do you want a, me to read it in chat or would you prefer to do it yourself? Okay, what he basically says is here in Pocatello, we just had a tornado watch and a severe thunderstorm warning and the rain and the hail were wild. What a backdrop for this presentation. And I think we're all seeing that type of stuff go on. I'm, you know, we don't have tornadoes generally in Idaho, but there's been a couple other tornado warnings recently. Yeah. <clears throat> and I don't know, was it the specific, was there a specific question there or just the, the comment? No, he's just making the comment that, yeah. and I think that's really important uh, when we see these types of things happening that they can be related to what you're talking about yeah. today. And let me let me go back and again, uh, Trent, uh, kind of get back to the, onto the science part of it. You know, a lot of these things, you know, people say, well, you know, we had this tornado here. Can you prove that climate change or that carbon dioxide uh, caused that? And I immediately say, no, I can't, I can't prove that, that that happened there. And I'm thinking back to, if you want to really prove something, then we have to have you know study here, study there, and and ideally we would find a, you know another 15 planets very you know identical to ours that are not undergoing climate change and see how many tornadoes they had. You know, we can't do that. What I'm what I try to get back to is that yes, these kinds of things are you know they are happening tornadoes here that we haven't had before, and but that is something that is is predicted more and more. That kind of violent weather is is predicted by most of the uh, climate change models that, uh, that, we, that we have today based on the, the data that we have and what happened when this, when this happened in the past. So we can predict out there, can we forecast exactly when it's gonna be? No. Can I prove that that was caused by climate change? No, not in the scientific sense of proof, but uh, it's certainly, there's certainly a correlation there. So, uh, well, yeah, and you know, and I talk about my family, Western Kansas, and in, you know, the 1930s, uh, the Dust Bowl days back in through there, they, that was that was a major drought. Uh, then we, you know, we've, we've kind of moved out of that, and now we're having another one. Uh, is th is this drought caused by climate change? Yeah, I can't necessarily prove that. Um, the the data, I mean, all of the models that we're running uh, would tend to indicate that that these uh, droughts are uh, at least exacerbated or made you know, longer and more severe because of the volatility and the and the and the warming of the temperatures. So, uh, yeah, we had to, you you guys we had the same storm that blew through here a little bit earlier in the day, and yeah, it was it was I don't think we had any tornado. I know we didn't have any tornadoes, but yeah, it was a it was a major event out there. I was in the swimming pool. <laughs> Making it back to the locker room was a challenge. This is uh, this is Trent Stevens in Pocatello again. Uh, another backdrop to this talk: um, we've just seen a, a terrible uh, hurricane pass through Puerto Rico again. They hadn't even recovered from the last one. From the last one, yeah. And, yeah. and now we've got another. Yeah, and I one. haven't. Uh, yeah, and I haven't been. I haven't had time the last email couple of days to. To, to look into that trend of is this is this one as bad as, as the one before or um, I know it was major at least as bad uh, possibly even worse yeah. well, the problem well, then, there is then, like you said go ahead well, the, the problem with this hurricane is they hadn't recovered from the last one yeah so <laughs> so yeah how do you tell it whether it's worse or not because we haven't even gotten back to where we should be from from the first one so uh, you know it's, it's just, just added the right on to their to their misery so yeah that's those folks uh, that's pretty tough down there these days I Anything recall, else, guys? Uh, a few years ago there was a major discussion about the ozone layer in the arctic and we were losing the ozone layer scientists went into the problem and looked at it and said indeed we are losing the ozone layer there could be some serious repercussions and the cause was 
the chlorofluorocarbons from refrigerants, which were being dumped and released into the atmosphere. At that time, they uh, realized the source of the problem and took steps to limit the release of chlorofluorocarbons, freon from refrigerators and air conditioning and eliminate the use of the dangerous ones which caused this ozone uh, depletion. And uh, recently, within the last year, I think, I saw that indeed the ozone layer is recovering. And uh, the, the bright spot in that is that when we discover a problem and we uh, see that there could be direct disastrous in, uh, results, we, we can do something and we can be successful at solving that. So we know that CO2 and methane are indeed causing problems. Uh, we have yet to bite the bullet, and I think there's more than just uh, stop burning coal uh, and start using nuclear power and stop, uh, you know, letting the gas come out of the cows. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot we can do, and one of them was mentioned way back in the 70s. Um, let's start using more economy. Let's use mass transit instead of having 20 cars to drive 20 people. Let's have one bus to drive 20 people. Yeah. Instead of having 2,000 cars to drive um, 200 people, let's use the train. Let's build mass transit. There's a lot of ways to re resolve the economic and the environmental problem besides um, just not doing stuff. Yeah. There's some positive actions we can take. No, so I, I'm I, Alan Perkins and I'm in Idaho Falls. Okay, Alan, nice to meet you. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. And I, uh, I'm looking back again to my day at the uh, you know, Silent Spring, uh, Rachel Carson and, and, and the, and the uh, ozone thing. Uh, and I've uh, you know, read different kinds of things and just even thought to myself, yeah, you know, that, was, that was some neat stuff. Um, and things were a little bit different in those days, but one of the big factors was you know, we, that was a that was a relatively simple, relatively straightforward kind of thing here. The the ozone was basically being destroyed by you know hydrochlorofluorocarbon, blah, 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 whatever that you know you say it, uh, yeah. and and so we could we could we could tackle that. Uh, and again, that was back in the days when politically. Somebody, somebody might have said, well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I may not necessarily agree with you. Or we have a little bit different philosophy here. And now we've gotten so much to, but, but at least people would listen. You know? And now we've gotten to the fact that to kind of the, this societal kind of thing that if something I say you disagree with, uh, it's not that we would disagree and we can sit down and talk about it. It's that you know, I'm a flaming idiot and don't know anything. So you're not going to buy anything that I say. And that's that's, that's part of the problem that we're having too. So, well, I, yeah, but we did, we were able to conquer those and that does, that does reignite some hope in me, you know, that we have conquered some of those kinds of things in the past and, and we were capable of doing it. And I look back again at some of the things that my you know, uh, grandparents and great aunts and uncles went through and they, they made it through that. So uh, that, that gives me hope too. Anything else, guys? Okay. Well, we're we're a little before our eight thirty, but um, that was really all I had for for tonight. If anybody has, you know, any other questions, we could we could certainly spend some time discussing things. I see there are some chat comments here. Um, but, but anybody else have something they'd like to say? Could I ask a favor? Uh, I, Debbie, do you know how many how many people we have total? Um, oops, Debbie, you're you're muted. <laughs> there are fifteen right now, and they were up to eighteen or nineteen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I I muted that. <laughs> um, I I one one thing is is that next week uh, we'll kind of have the very same format. Is that true? Yeah, Do you, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to uh, probably uh, maybe. I'm thinking a little less. Um, okay, 
little less I of my discussion. I think that little... that probably, uh, let me see, CH, uh, I, it, the chat is, I appreciate your information about population growth and the need for population control. Limiting family size is not a popular position, yet it is something I think needs serious consideration. We humans seem to be outpa outpacing, outgrowing our limited resources. And yeah. that was Kathy from the Eagle area in Northwest Boise. So yeah. that's an interesting yeah. comment, right. which I think is a very valid one at this point. No, I Thank think that is you know, that, that is something that we that we definitely as a as a population as a species that we that we need to look at. Uh, as far as next week, I, I did have some I do have some other uh, kind of additional uh, kind of things to to throw in here, but I wanted to keep that part of it a little a little shorter and then uh, launch into some, some discussion of of some solutions. And as I alluded to tonight. Uh, the number of possible solutions that are out there are just about as many as the number of problems that we have. Um, and it's just simply going to be a matter of, um, uh, as we talked about, recognizing that no one thing is going to solve all of our problems, that we're going to have to be doing a whole bunch of things at one time. And uh, that everybody, I mean, everybody is going to have to get involved in this and, uh, you know, in order to make a difference. So that's. Uh, That'll be next week, and then the the last week is again. I'd just like to continue with that, and then even um, I think you know throw it open for um, other uh, people to bring up suggestions of some things we might do, and 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 try to try to end up uh, on a hopefully end up on a positive note. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Hey, well, thank you, all for, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you all for joining and participating. I, I appreciate it. And thank you for your comments and uh, look forward to uh, seeing and hearing from everybody again next Wednesday. Debbie, I have a question. Yes. Yes, sir. Is the sign in next week the same? Yes. Yes, it, yes, it will be. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for your presentation. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay. Goodbye, guys. Have a good one. You too.